Ladies and gentlemen, dear engineers and scientists, today we are going to do two applications of Newton's laws. One of them involving frictional forces and the other involving circular motion. First, let's remember previous episodes. Let's remember uh, we investigated motion. Displacement is change in position. Average velocity is this ratio of displacement to time. Instantaneous velocity is the derivative of either displacement or position with respect to time. Average acceleration is the ratio of change in velocity to time. And instantaneous acceleration is the derivative of acceleration with time. Conversely, Integral of acceleration gives the change in velocity. Integral of velocity gives the displacement. When an observer in, is in motion, the relative velocity is velocity seen by the stationary observer minus the velocity of the observer. Relative acceleration is the acceleration in stationary observer uh, minus the acceleration of the observer. We looked at two cases of motion, uniformly accelerated, where A is a constant, so change in velocity is just AT, uh, and displacement is 1 over 2 AT squared plus V0, and the time-independent formula is 2AS is difference in V squared. And uniform circular motion, where uh, the angle theta is changing at a constant rate, omega t, in which case the period of motion is uh, t is 2 pi over omega. If this particle is moving in a circle with radius r, then the position at uh, the center of the circle is at origin, then the position is given as r cosine omega t i plus sine omega t j, indicating that the projection of, on the x-axis is r cosine omega t, and on the y-axis, r sine omega t. Its derivative gives me velocity, and second derivative gives me acceleration. Note that acceleration is centripetal, that is directed towards the center of the circle and its magnitude is given by v square over r, and its direction, again, please note, centripetal. We also looked at a uh, recipe for solving problems. Uh, our recipe involves isolating each body and drawing a free body diagram for it, and showing all forces acting on that particular body. We write Newton's laws for each of the body, Newton's second law. Now, uh, if there are internal forces, we will have more unknowns and need more equations. In this case, we will find relations between accelerations, that is, constraints, and write them as equations. When we have as many equations as unknowns, we solve them all, and then we check everything. When we look at the frictional force acting on this book, physics book, I see that when I try to push it, it doesn't move, indicating that the frictional force is exactly equal to the force I apply. But as I increase the force, it starts moving, which means the frictional force cannot increase beyond a certain point. I do this thing with this cup and find that the force, uh, again, has a limit. I add some mass to it and repeat the experiment. In this case, I see that I need a bigger force to get it into motion. From this, I understand that static frictional force as whatever it takes to prevent sliding 
but it has an upper limit, and that upper limit is proportional to the normal force between these two surfaces. The kinetic friction, that is the frictional force that acting when this item is in motion, it is already sliding, as seen to be independent of the, or relatively independent of the speed it is moving on the surface. And also it is relatively independent of the amount of force I apply. So the static, uh, kinetic friction is proportional to the normal force uh, and is independent of the speed and the acceleration of the sliding object. That is, static frictional force is less than mu static times normal, where normal is the normal force. And uh, kinetic frictional force is equal to mu kinetic times normal. This is directed in such a way as to prevent sliding motion. And this is directing in such a way as to stop the sliding motion. In general, the kinetic constant is smaller than the static constant. When I am lowering my hand gradually, I am increasing the angle theta. And when I do that, sine theta increases and cosine theta decreases until I get to the point where the eraser slides of my hand. At this point, the motion no longer static, but now it is kinetic. And I have kinetic friction uh, from the, for the rest of the story. Okay, so let's look at it. As I increase sine theta, static frictional force increases gradually until it gets to the point where it is mu times normal, where normal force is mg cosine theta. And from there, the motion uh, starts and the friction is kinetic. Because mu k is less than mu static, uh, I have a sudden drop in the frictional force and it continues there. Here, please note that people are usually taught that static frictional force as mu times normal. Uh, you will have read this in many occasions. This is pure fiction. The reason it has been taught is that in OSS exam, it turns out that this corner is asked more often than this whole thing. And so they teach you just this corner rather than the general case. In general, static frictional force is less than mu times normal and is equal to whatever it takes to prevent motion. On the other hand, kinetic frictional force is equal to mu kinetic times normal. We saw that the eraser fell off when my hand was at about 70 or 75 degrees, and this indicates that mu s was uh, three and a half or four, uh, which is a quite a large number, and uh, there is no limit uh, as to mu s being is forced to become uh, less than one. The, here my hand was sweaty and uh, that object was plastic. So the coefficient of friction between a sweaty hand or wet hand and plastic can be as large as four. When we are talking about static or kinetic friction, we mean whether sliding motion exists or not. In this particular case, if that box on this card is 
at rest with respect to the cart, while the cart is being pulled along, the motion is static as far as the friction is concerned because there is no sliding motion. And if this car is going off without wheel slip, then the friction between the wheel surface and the asphalt is static. If there is wheel slip, then it is kinetic. Our second topic in this video will be circular motion. First, uniform circular motion. I have a body of mass M performing uniform circular motion with radius R and angular speed omega so that its period is T equals 2 pi over omega. In which case the acceleration we have already noted as V square over R and is directed in the radial the direction radially inward in the centripetal direction. By Newton 2, the force is mass times acceleration, same direction as the acceleration, so mv square over r again in the centripetal direction. The force is centripetal. There is no such thing as a centrifugal force. Whoever says that is seeing ghosts imagining things. Now, uh, in the frame of the rotating observer, that is according to the rotating observer, the, I am exerting a force towards myself on the eraser and the eraser is at rest. Please note that it is not do doing any motion in my frame. It is always in front of me. Therefore, I conclude that there is some unseen force, a ghost pulling it away from me. When I was rotating, I saw that fictitious force, the centrifugal force. If you believe, what I said when I was rotating, then you should believe the rest of that too. Namely, the razor was at rest in my hand, but the rest of this room was rotating around me. In fact, all the buildings were rotating around me. In fact, the whole world was rotating around me. Now, if you don't believe that, then you have to agree that the statements of the non-inertial observer, the rotating observer, are not to be taken seriously. Namely, the forces in the non-inertial frame are fictitious forces, and these are not actual real forces. To convince you that centrifugal force is not an actual force, I will make one more statement. If you insist that it is a real force, you cannot pass this course forever and ever. Now, when I say that the force is centripetal, I mean the resultant force or the net force, the sum of all actual forces is centripetal. The force acting on this eraser is the gravitational force downwards and the force by my hand either downwards, sideways, upwards, or etc. But the sum total of it is mv square over r centripetal. It is not that a gravitational force, a contact force by the arm, and a centripetal force. It is that the centripetal force is the resultant of the contact force by my hand and the gravitation. If my circular motion is non-uniform, that is, if its speed is increasing or 
decreasing, then the acceleration will have a tangential component. If the speed is increasing, it will be in the forward, and if it is decreasing in the backward direction. Then the acceleration vector will have a centripetal and a tangential component, and it will be ahead of the center if its speed is increasing, and behind the center if its speed is decreasing. So if omega is not constant, but its derivative is alpha equals d omega dt, then the acceleration is centripetal, same, plus a tangential, which is alpha times r, and the force is m times this. So the force has a centripetal component and a tangential component if the circular motion is non-uniform. In this video, we saw applications of Newton's laws involving friction and involving circular motion. Thank you for watching.